character and when he might appear or where. But it took an angel to push that hope into the present and prepare them for the Messiah's arrival. Many had felt it's about time. That's because they lived in darkness. In fact, it was not only darkness, the prophet Isaiah had it right. He called it a deep darkness, not just darkness, a deep darkness. They'd gone from a high of being selected by God to be chosen people to a low of waiting forever for this Messiah to come. God decided to use them as a nation, the stage on which the world would discover what God was up to and what God could accomplish. He delivered them from captivity in Egypt to their own promised land. He had given them the Ten Commandments, those principles to guide their lives personally and, and as a nation as well. But those ten principles sort of, sort of backfired. They found it impossible to keep them perfectly, and they were frustrated. They even developed some 613 supporting laws to help guide them along the way to make sure that they stood a chance of obeying those Ten Commandments perfectly. Well, have we all set our sights on a goal and failed? I have. It started early for me, let me tell you. It was during elementary school. It was a small thing, supposedly. But one day we walked into the gym, and there a gym teacher looked up. Ah, uh, there it was. Attached to the ceiling, the rope. Now, the structure of this gym was such that it had a big hole in the second floor. So there's a track that went around that second floor. And it was totally free all the way up to the top of the second floor of the gymnasium. Guess what he expected us to do? <laughs> I watched. I was very interested. I, I really watched. And I get to watch a lot because I kept backing up to the end of the line. <laughs> I was the smallest kid in the class with weak arms and a fear of heights and, unfortunately, an inability to fly. <laughs> Later as a senior in Iowa, I developed some athletic ability, but boy, at the bottom of that rope, <laughs> our gym teacher said, okay, no one left. That was bad news. I looked around and he was right. And so I started to climb the rope. Well, I got part of the way up, maybe two thirds of the way up, until my hands just clutched that rope. And I looked down, and there was my very small gym teacher <laughs> standing on a very thin, quite insecure mat. Well, eventually I found my way down. <laughs> Not the way you're imagining, but <laughs> down that rough rope. Remember that rough rope? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what happened to me that day. And I, I don't forget it now. And my friends didn't forget it then for a long time. Mm -hmm. I was discouraged. I wanted to do well. I tried my best. I failed. In a similar way, that's the way it was with the Old Testament people of Israel. But they tried, most of them. They failed, couldn't do it. It was an impossible task to get right and get God's approval. <laughs> the solution to their frustration about getting right with God as well as your way and my way was found in a most unlikely place, in the middle of some sheep and some teenage shepherds let him sleep from their eyes in a field outside of a backwater town called Bethlehem. It's not as if God had reached out to his people before. Again and again, God had. In creation, God created a perfect world, invited Adam and Eve to enjoy it to the full. It was a marvelous situation. But they decided that they really didn't need God. Not an unfamiliar feeling about us on rare occasions, I hope. So they declared their independence from God. 
And they blew that situation. And then God showed his power and care by leading the people out of captivity out of Egypt. Uh, and on that wonderful high moment in the life of their nation, and individually, they said, oh, this is neat. It's sort of like when you've been on a retreat and you've got a high and you want to keep it. God says, I'll show you how to keep it. I'm going to give you 10 principles, 10 guidelines. We call them the 10 commandments. Follow them. And you'll have a right relationship with me, but also with one another. Well, some couldn't keep them. And others didn't have that much interest. In another attempt, God sent the prophets. Now, the prophets weren't people who just occasionally told the future. Their main job was to set people right and say, hey, this is the way you're supposed to behave in terms of God. And they heard them. And they drove them out of town. And those they didn't drive out of town, they killed them. They didn't want to hear it. But the prophets were men of vision. And God had revealed to them, and they declared to the people that this Messiah, this Deliverer, was going to appear, set them free from their sins, and give them new lives. And God decides to finally devised a way to get their attention. If creation can't do it, and other things, even floods, and, and Egyptian freedom, and the prophet's words, if they can't do it, I've got to get their attention in some way, and here it is. A baby. Yeah. That's not what they were expecting at all. It was a surprising way, a startling way, and it's God's final rescue <coughs> of his people in the form of a little baby. You see, somebody built a manger. And that's where they found him, in the manger. They soon had company, those teenagers who down the hill and had that marvelous vision. Oh yeah, they showed up and said, let us tell you what happened. Angels in the sky and a, an amazing message and boy, we shook up. But we had to tell you, we had to see this baby. And that's what happened. Because the angels had, Messiah, had announced the Messiah at last. Not through a fanfare in the middle of Jerusalem. No. But in a gentle way, a strong way, a loving and true way. And so his words were heart welcomed by those who needed peace, this Jesus. His ministry would be strong and special. He was named Jesus, you remember, because it means deliverer. That was his job. That's who he was to deliver us from our sins to God in a new relationship. Wow. Came to deliver us from a sinful relationship and into God relationship. He saved us. And you see, he did something else. He did another one of his surprises. He did it on a cross. Again. Rising again to a new life, this Jesus. To live among them, and they saw him again. Another of God's surprises. What began at Bethlehem continued throughout all of Jesus' life, to his death and beyond it. And at last, the beginning of a new life with God had finally appeared. Now, I've mentioned about the birth of Jesus. It's the beginning of the end of waiting. People of Israel, and we didn't have to wait any longer, and you don't have to wait any longer, and I don't have to wait any longer. Now, at last, we reach the beginning of the end now. First is the end of the beginning of waiting and worry. Now, it's the beginning of the end, a happy end. Your end and my end. Are you ready? Your death and my death. It's a strange thing to bring up on a Christmas Eve, isn't it? My goodness. That's a time for happiness because of that. How's that you're probably saying? Well, you see, it's not as much a Christmas gift from God, it's an Easter gift that began in Bethlehem. It's God's gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ on the cross 
for us. Jesus gave us eternal life. They're not the most familiar words he ever said, I guess. I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And the one who lives and believes in me, never going to die. Spiritually alive forever. And the assurance of living in God's heavenly kingdom is another great gift we receive. Because of Jesus' birth at Bethlehem. I've been watching too much TV lately. <laughs> Two for one sandals. They hooked it with one little device or something that frankly seemed to have magical properties. And a 1999 cost, right? And then, but it's not over. Ah! But didn't get a second one. Two for one! <laughs> You and I have got them two for one. Earth in Bethlehem. Resurrection in Jerusalem. But you know what? It's not two for one. It's three for one. There's another gift God gives us and it all began in Bethlehem. And that's the gift of the second coming. You don't hear much about that in Presbyterian churches. That's the surprise. Jesus gives us that as well. He says, look folks, I'm coming again. Gonna wrap things up. And all you faithful people are gonna know that you belong to me and I belong to you more than ever. That's the second coming. So my friends, in this wonderful season of surprises, to realize in this silent night what life-changing gifts God has given to us. Little wonder we sing such hymns as Joy to the World. Don't do that one yet. And it'll come all ye faithful. And so many others celebrate the birth of Jesus for all he brings to us. So my prayer, may this Christmas season more than any other bring home to us God's love, God's care to each one of us. Let us pray. Lord, it's amazing what began at Bethlehem. How it surges through our lives in faith, changes things, changes us, makes us belong into Christ, and to walk into a new, strong, abundant life in Him. How we thank you. So hear us read our heart as we sing wonderful songs of praise to you this Christmas night. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.
how appropriate. In this season of giving, to be more sensitive to ever in our patterns of giving. On the top of our giving pattern, I would hope that we would have gifts to the work of Christ through this church and through this particular church as well. So as we approach our offering today, ask you to remember all the blessings you have received in the past year, the care that you received throughout your life, and the joy you have in being partners with Christ in this world. Let us worship God with our offering. Thank you. 
There are so many ways to describe God's gift of Jesus Christ. Probably the most unique one is found in John's Gospel, in those first 14 chapters. It's a different kind of a summary. It reminds us that Jesus is unique. He is nothing less than the Son of God. Hear God's word for us as we find it in John's Gospel, beginning with the first verse. Hear the word of God for us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood. There came a man who was sent from John. His name was John, from God, his name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man is coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, nor a husband's will, but born of God. Where became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. Amen. I hope each one of you has a candle. The procedure is important, I guess, because. We will be giving each of you, and you in turn to one another, the light of the candle. And for the course, for us, and for the maintenance staff, is that when you receive the light, you put your wick into the flame, then hold yours upright, and remain upright with it, while someone else dips their candle into yours, rather than tipping yours over the light. With that in mind, Jesus, the light of the world, is what we remember this day. And the five in your bullet and an insert, it has the words from that very familiar and treasured song, Son of God.
having borne testimonies to the light of the world, we extinguish our lights so that we may join in singing hymn number 179. Joy to the world because the Lord has come.